Hello, and welcome to Season 6 of Beyond Teaching, a podcast from the Psych Sessions Network. I'm Eric Landrum from Boise State University, one of Beyond Teaching's three co-hosts. My other two co-hosts are Susan Nolan from Seton Hall University and Adiyinka Kinsular smith from the City College of New York. These four episodes of Season 6 were recorded from March of 2023 through July of 2023, and they are dropped for a special Leap Day release on February 29th, 2024. In some ways, this is a mini-season with four episodes to present. Episode 1 features two international doctoral students at the time of the recording, and this episode is amazing. It's where I learned about deficit-based cultures and strengths-based cultures. In Episode 2, Yinka, Susan, and I discuss email etiquette, which appears to be an ongoing challenge for many folks in higher education. In Episode 3, Susan and I get a chance to discuss leadership transitions in one's career, addressing the joys as well as the drawbacks. We closed the Leap Day mini-session release with episode four, where Susan and I welcome special guest Sue France. We get a chance to discuss multiple recent transitions for Sue, as well as new challenges. It's all part of the knowledge and skills that psychology professionals need to know about. The stuff that we were not taught in graduate school. That is beyond teaching. Welcome to season six. Hello, and welcome to another edition of Beyond Teaching. I'm so pleased to be here today. I am, we're, we're missing one. We'll get to that in a moment. I'm Eric Landrum from Boise State University, and I am here delightfully speaking with my friend. Susan Nolan from Seton Hall University. I know, I threw her a curveball. <laughs> she thought I was going to introduce her, but then I paused. <laughs> and, you know, we do this to each other all the time. We are sorry to be missing our colleague, Yinka Akinsular smith from City College of New York. I know that's a longer title than that. That's the only one I'm going to give. City College of New York, <laughs> State College of New York, County College of New York. It goes on and on and on. If you can ever listen to this, she can correct me as much as she'd like to. <laughs> Folks, don't worry about her. She'll be back on a future episode. She just had another um, conflict and she couldn't make it with us today. So Susan and I were spitballing before we turned on record on here on the microphones. And I think we're going to talk about transitions. Is that right, Susan? That is right. And I think maybe we'll start by talking about the transition from chair back to regular faculty member. But we're also going to talk about other kinds of transitions out of academia, from different levels, from assistant to associate to full professor. Yeah, different, different types of transitions that, that we can encounter. Yeah, and hopefully... I guess our stories can be relevant and generalized to to anyone's story. And and I obviously we're talking now in July of 2023, and it's relevant for me because my most recent transition from department chair for psychological science at Boise State back to full professor, my term of my four year term of service as department chair ended on June thirtieth. My Independence Day was July 1st. I ended up shaving all the hair off my face. Not that I had a lot to begin with. as my little independence celebration. I do have the furry little uh, eyebrows, and that's about it. <laughs> Things will grow back eventually, we think. Um, and, and so uh, for me, uh, I was commenting to Susan before we hit record, there's, there's a lot to deconstruct there. I won't go into all the details, but, you know, the kind of the catchphrase People use sometimes like when they when they are done with a committee or a big commitment is they get their life back, right? Which is a little bit overly dramatic. I I think what I've realized in the past two to three weeks is that I've gotten portions of my brain space back. I was department chair for four years. I worried about curriculum. I worried about student conflicts and student complaints to the department. I worried about funding faculty travel. I worried about uh, interactions, upcoming interactions with the dean. And was I meeting the needs of the college and representing the department well? I worried a lot. I carried a lot of worry on my shoulders. And now I I feel like I've gotten my brain space back. Yeah, 
I, uh, I know this is your second transition from being chair to being a regular faculty member because you were previously chair. And I also did a stint at Seton Hall as chair. So I've experienced the transition. And um, what you describe also really resonates with me because as a chair, you're, you're almost always on call. There's always some kind of a fire to put out. Um, and also you could just let that completely consume you as chair and only be putting out fires and getting schedules together, et cetera. But a good chair does more than that and finds ways to work with their colleagues to make the department better. And so I think that's one of the things that weighs on you while you're chair is I don't want to just put out the fires. I want to work with my colleagues to, to see what we can do to not just have status quo. And Susan, so all of those worries go away. I'm saying that when you're, when you stop being chair, you still want to work to make the department better, but you don't feel that weight on your shoulders in the same way that you do as chair. And Susan, if I'm remembering correctly, you've played some larger roles at, at uh, Seton Hall as well. You, weren't you an associate dean for a while? You directed a uh, campus-wide assessment for accreditation. I mean, you've, you've mm-hmm. been chair, but you've been more than chair. Is that correct? Yes. And I, I also was director of our women's studies program, which is now women and gender studies. It was women's studies when I was directing it. Um, yep. So I had, I've had a few different roles and actually made a decision a few years back that I didn't want to do administration anymore. I wanted to be a, as I call it, plain old faculty member because I value doing scholarship, which really takes a hit when you're in administration. And I also greatly value my interactions in the professional world beyond Seton Hall, including with the Society for the Teaching of Psychology, the ability to do what I'm doing with you right now, our Psych Sessions podcast. Um, I do a Psychology Today regular blog as well. These are all kinds of things that I, I wouldn't be able to do. So that's when you talk about getting control over your professional life again. For me, that was the deciding factor and deciding to to stay as a plain old faculty member. Right. And I think there's some interesting themes emerging. For one, I think for probably everyone, there's going to be multiple transition, multiple transitions in one's academic career, uh, whether it's going to be serving in different leadership roles or for me, even the same leadership role multiple times. Uh, we have to be able to transition in and out and be ready to be flexible to change. I've talked about kind of getting that brain space back, but also there's been, you know, and by the way, so for example, this coming fall, I'm going to have RAs again, research assistants, which I haven't had in four years. I'm going to restart a program of research where I've had some projects just sitting fallow waiting because I just, I personally, and I know some department chairs because you research at the same time, I wasn't able to do it. I just couldn't do it and be, and provide a good experience to students. So I'm going to be gaining some things back, but it also, I should admit that I'm going to be losing some things. I was on a 12 month contract as department chair, and I'm going to be returning to a nine month contract as that regular faculty member. And that is a loss of almost 25% if I've done the math correctly in my head. So, you know, there's that calculation as well. Getting that life back is a, calculated loss of salary, which I've been looking forward to for a long time. But we have other colleagues who, you know, probably become a department chair, get accustomed to the salary bump and go, I can't not be salary chair because they've adjusted their life to live that certain lifestyle. Yeah. Yeah. I I think another loss is what I was saying earlier about the ability to be a leader and have a bigger say in changes that might occur. And so I think you lose, you lose that as well. If there's something very rewarding about, we, we, when I was chair, we did an overhaul of our major. Very rewarding to, to really, uh, it was, we're a very um, collaborative department. Um, so leadership in my department is, is not maybe how it is in some places. We, we all really work together, but um, it's just very rewarding to, um, see that process through. And so I do miss being able to do things like that. But then you can find the same sort of rewarding. For example, I 
was recently on the APA Undergraduate Guidelines Committee, a committee that you have been on in the past, Eric. And that's also very rewarding. So you're getting to, to create something. Right. So I, I think leaders that step down can probably find leader. That's a really great point, Susan. Leaders that step down can probably find leadership positions in other ways, places, times, either yeah. on their campus or through organizations they're affiliated with. That's a really great point. I think we have colleagues that go through other types of transitions as well. Those who are applying from assistant professor for associate professor with tenure, I think those folks have transitions that they face. I, I, think, I think I read an article recently that the great resignation is over, but I still think we have colleagues who, are, who started their career post-PhD or post-terminal degree in higher ed who are still leaving higher ed. And there's a transition. In fact, our own Asani Sewell, who started yeah. this, who co-founded this podcast with us with her PhD, went from one institution, gained tenure, went to another institution, gained tenure, and then left higher ed altogether. And so, you know, I mean, right, she- Right, for the clinical world, just to, for our listeners who don't know, she went um, to be right. in the clinical world. Yeah. And she's a delightful case study of someone and she actually shared a little bit of that in some earlier episodes, yeah. in the earlier seasons about her transition to an eating disorders institute, if I remember, or or a subsection of a larger hospital who was doing that type of clinical work. And, so, you know, maybe I think transition and change is obviously yeah. an important part of all of our lives. But for me, it's just sailing it right now because I happen to be going through it. I really appreciate you letting me babble on about it. <laughs> well, I think we well, I, it, I'm really enjoying listening to this because I, it's bringing to mind for me the idea of a reset. I think in those of us who are in academia in any way, no matter what your path is, if you're a contingent faculty member or all the different possible tracks that are out there, um, you're, you're having changes that occur, some that you're choosing and some that are promotions that you're excited about, others when you lose an opportunity, but another door opens. Um, and I think when that happens, um, so for, for me right now, I'm coming off of the sabbatical, which is another transition for those of us lucky enough to get sabbaticals. Um, coming off of that is another chance to say, okay, how do I want to come back into my job at Seton Hall? Uh, obviously, I've been working the whole time, but not on, on, on sabbatical projects. So very different. So thinking about the committees I want to either rejoin or, or not, um, other different ways in which I want to do service? Um, what scholarship do I want to pick up that, you know, I, I was doing a number of things before I left on sabbatical and I've done different things on sabbatical. So what threads am I going to pick up going forward? And it's, I think, an amazing opportunity when we can make that reset. And that's what I'm hearing from you too. You're, you're making these choices about what you want to do going forward. Well, I think reset is a great word to use there because I think just about every academic in the entire planet had that reset opportunity during COVID. And during the pandemic, I think everyone had a chance, maybe forcefully and sometimes against their will, to reset. You know, academics going home to teach for a year, for 18 months, and everyone going online, everyone had to reset. And then coming back from the pandemic, quite honestly, Susan, I don't think everyone's back from the pandemic yet. I mean, I still have a couple of faculty members who haven't returned to their offices full time. And by the way, I'm okay with that. I want them to be comfortable wherever they're teaching. But, you know, I, I don't think we're ever going to be back to normal. I'm using air quotes now. I think this is the new normal. We want people to be comfortable. People who never taught online before are now teaching online full time. We have telecommuting faculty members where they are teaching. We have one full-time faculty member who now lives in Oregon, and she has students who work in her lab. They work online. She attends all of her faculty meetings on Zoom, obviously. She's a fully participating faculty member. She serves on committees. Um, that was a big transition for her and for us. Yeah. And I, I, think, I think this is the new normal or whatever cliche yeah. we can attach to yeah. this. And, and, and this is the transition for all of us and it's going to yes. be transition after transition. 
in in and this also makes me think of what you said earlier about the great resignation maybe not being over and i think academia is a weird place where a, a lot of people sort of just quit their jobs but i think for people in academia it's something you make a decision to segue out and i actually know of several people uh in our worlds who are planning an early retirement from their quote unquote day job in academia to to do other projects just to step out of that that rat race because so many people got burned out during the pandemic so i think the great resignation is not over for academia for, for academics because um, many folks in these jobs are working toward that it's not well, easy well and i th i think what you made me think of is that maybe we're in the midst of i'm, I'm going to coin this term the great reinvention, perhaps, mm -hmm. uh, whether they're, you know, maybe they're, how many of our friends, our colleagues have gone from associate and full professors to directors for centers of teaching and learning yes. or directors of assessment centers because they have this, you know, Swiss army knife skill set of a PhD and they can pivot to doing something different. Maybe they become a dean or a provost. And a couple of them college presidents around the country or CTL directors. They become active in pod. And they do that. Or they go off and they do something else academia related. And many of them leave academia altogether and they work for a publishing company or they get out all, all together, all together. And so I think there may, it may not be the great resignation, but the great reinvention. Reinvention, yes. Of, of their careers or what they want to do. Or they do, like you said, they want to retire early and maybe they want to travel with a spouse or be with grandkids or they want to write the great American novel or whatever they want to do. And we've the actually people had I know who are planning right. to retire early are planning others are there's other things, usually even work related things right. that they're right. yeah. But but it's more under their control is what I see. The things right. that they're and, choosing. And I forget the the great... Can I ask you a question, though? Oh, okay. yeah, sure, sure, sure. So you yeah. used two acronyms um, or abbreviations, one was CTL, which I know, Centers for Teaching and Learning, Oops. and then you said something called SHOD, and I yeah. don't know what that is. I'm sorry, it's the Professional Organizational Network, and that or that acronym doesn't make any sense, but it's where faculty developers go, okay. and so people who work in CTL, that's their tribe, that's their organization. Okay. Thank you, you go to pod, there's annual meetings and they have regional meetings as well. Thank you. And I so, figured if I didn't know it, some of our listeners might not. No, I appreciate so. that. Thank you. I was just, I was just rambling. I, I, <laughs> I, I wasn't. Thank you. Yeah. Professional organizational network in the, 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 I believe the website is podnetwork.org. Okay. And we cool. can put that in the show notes. And uh, I've been to the annual organization once and it was overwhelming. Uh, I'm not a I'm not a center for teaching and learning developer, I'm not a faculty developer, but I was dabbling in it. So I went once. You know, when you go to a dinner with a thousand people in a ballroom, you don't get to meet anybody except the people <laughs> at your table. Right. Well, I didn't get to meet anybody except the people at my table. So, yep. but yeah, you, you're you're absolutely right. Lots of people are are reinventing, or even I'm just thinking differently about going back and. I've mentioned this, I think, in previous podcasts about ways that I'm trying to not get bogged down and really time consuming things that I don't have to do. And so I, at this point, for peer review, I kind of count how many I owe in terms of how many people have reviewed something for me. So if I have three reviewers on a paper, then I owe three to the world. And then after that, especially if things are crazy, I, I, I say no. I also have decided that per summer I can do three external reviews for promotion for faculty members at other institutions because they can take a really long time. It can take, you know, if I'm lucky, I can do it in one eight-hour day, um, but usually more than that. So I've, I've started trying to reset in terms of thinking about, yes, I want to be a good citizen of our field, but I also want to think about what's a fair place to, to draw a line. At first, first off, that's an interesting criteria. Uh, for external reviews, I, I write a fair number of those as well. And I've come to the point, well, I'll only write for people or institutions that I know well. And so when I get a cold call or a cold ask, I just say no. But if it's the, if I know the person or if I know the department well, yeah, 
I will usually say yes, but you're right. And I think I've done two this summer and I'm going to owe two more before school starts, which is about a month from now. And and uh, yeah, I, I, I can never do it all in one day. I have to spread mine out. So I, I'll work on it two hours, four days in a row. Mm-hmm. I, I, a whole day, I just get a headache. But, but that's a good tip to listeners. You know, those letters are really hard to write because you have to read all the recommendations. You have to read all the stuff from the school. Then you have to read through all the materials. And I just did one a couple of weeks ago where the faculty member sent a 118-page PDF. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I didn't read every single page, every single word, but I had to read enough of it because one of the questions the school asked was, what would, what's the most impressive work of the applicant? Yes. Yeah. I mean, and, and you want to give details. I also, if they don't, they don't always count for me. So, you know, you want to go through and make sure they've given X number of conference presentations, which is above the blah, 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 expected. And so it really is very, very, t- and I, I'll, I read some of their journal articles. I, I won't read them all, but you want to get a sense, especially if they've got anything solo authored. So it's, it's incredibly time consuming and it's so important for them that it's, it's not something you want to, I mean, a student recommendation letter is also incredibly important, but with a student recommendation letter, you have a really small amount, comparatively small amount of information. They were in your class, they came to your lab meetings or whatever, and then you just look at all of that and you can write the letter in a few hours. But for somebody who you don't know and who has this massive 118 page PDF, that's not atypical. But yeah, so I just decided three is my limit. Now, if um, somebody that you know I knew well who was allowed to have external reviewers who knew them, because some schools will allow that, I would, as a favor, I would break my rule. But you know, if it's just, cold call out of the blue. I, after I have three, that's it. So I got my three asks a few weeks ago and now I'm no. <laughs> but interestingly, it's kind of reset. For, for me, it's a reset. It, interestingly, now we're on the flip side of transitions where people who are applying for promotion, a tenure or promotion to full, this is part of their transition yeah. uh, where their institution has to have this process I did see an interesting little note. I did one, I'm not going to say the name of the school, and I did complete it, and I completed it a month early, but they were giving me all the instructions for their for the letter writer, and they did add in there, there will be a note in the applicant's file if you do not complete the letter after saying that you would complete the letter. Oh, and I thought that was an that interesting reflect- twist. That would reflect badly on them. That would, you know, that would, in theory, reflect badly on the person applying. Yes. Because I said yes at first. And, I and then you looked at it through. and you didn't do it. Yeah, because they would think, they would think, oh, Eric Landrum looked at the file and didn't have anything nice to say. Even well, if that's agreed not the case. to it at first. Maybe he didn't even look at the file, but was, thought he was so busy or so important that he didn't bother to write the letter. So I thought it was an interesting social psychology twist of a phrase saying, we will note that you didn't complete this letter if you don't complete this letter. I'm guessing that the reason that they do that is because they want to help the applicant by saying we did, in fact, ask for five external letters and only four came through. It's not the applicant's fault. Right. But I do think it could look actually bad because... You can imagine that I was asked, I looked at it and like, oh, this is a disaster. Better to just not write anything. And and I think part of, you know, if it, if it works the way- Which I would never is, do. In my place, you know, the, the letter writer, the, the person, the applicant gets asked for names and then they put forward some names. The institution generates yeah. some names and then the institution picks who gets asked. So, there are plenty of places though that aren't, that formalized and the applicant can just oh. pick their people. When I, it's changed at Seton Hall, but when I went out for full, um, we could just give them a list, the chair a list, they would write to them. So um, I know in some cases, the person's picking their, their own. We don't do that anymore. Now we're more formalized, but. But I thought that little, I'm going to call it a dig. I thought that little dig was interesting. 
And I, and of course, I wrote the letter and I didn't need that, but. Yeah. No, I always made the letter, of course. That little guilt. Yeah, I, I don't do think, think I've, I don't ever, think I've ever not come through. Yeah, I mean, everybody I've ever, I feel lucky, everybody I've ever had to do this for, I've been able to be positive. Sometimes I can be glowing because they're so amazing. But I, fortunately, I've never had somebody that was a disaster and I had to write that. Which is a good sign for institutions. They shouldn't be putting people in the position where they're going up for something. That, right. And yeah. that, that's a great point that if someone is going up for promotion and tenure, promotion to full, and they're limping across the finish line or just barely making the threshold, it's not the person's fault. It's their colleague's fault. Yes. Usually. Because Usually. The, their colleagues have not been good mentors. Yes. And and something has gone wrong with the process of annual review and progress towards tenure or s- some sort of progress in annual reporting has gone wrong yeah. if, there, if it's a close call at the time of the decision. I agree. Unless an applicant has just blatantly ignored every piece of feedback they've gotten from their colleagues, mm-hmm. which is super rare, super rare. So. I agree. Yeah. So, so this um, has been a really, I think, great conversation. I think it's summer in the Northern Hemisphere. Um, so for those of us who are having a summer, um, even though most of us work all summer long, it's it's kind of a, a break in between the regular academic year. I think this is a, it can be a reset for anybody, even if you're not transitioning roles. And it's a good opportunity to think about, um, to think about how you want to live your professional life differently and it, in some ways to be better at your job and in other ways to protect your own psychological well-being and and your your non-work time and i do think within certain parameters academics especially compared to other people in the workplace academics have some control over their own personal resets meaning yeah. you might be a researcher and you might be on a tenure track path where you owe one publication a year. But if you don't like the sensation perception research that you're doing, hopefully your institution says you owe one publication a year, but you could do a research and switch to memory research or abnormal psychology research or something else. I think academics sometimes don't realize the flexibility they have to meet the needs of the institution. I think, I I think we can do our own resets. We don't have to wait for a pandemic to come. In other words, I think academics have more agency than they think they do sometimes within the confines and parameters of their institutional needs. I think that's a good place to end this conversation. And I really appreciate you sharing your uh, transition, your current transition uh, experience. Thank you, Susan. I'm glad I have the headspace to share it. (laughs) I appreciate that. Thank you.